My name is R. Crosby Lyles, and this is News from the Can. The word Armageddon is nominally used to refer to any end-of-the-world scenario, but originally referred to a location prophesied in the Bible to be the site of a great end-times battle. Our shameless usage here describes a snow line formed by the sudden onset of a new ice age, argued to be imminent by a group of not-so-mainstream lay scientists spurred on by the likes of Art Bell and Whitley Strieber. It's a jagged boundary of snow around the 40th parallel north of which apocalyptic snowfall is speculated to accumulate deep enough to crush an ordinary wood frame house. Various renderings have this line following closely to the old Mason-Dixon line that separated the slave states of the Old South from the free states of the North. Those not familiar with this concept of sudden onset ice age might want to read The Coming Global Superstorm published in 1999 by Art Bell and Whitley Strieber or just watch the movie The Day After Tomorrow based on the book, released in 2004, written, produced, and directed by Roland Emmerich, who also did Independence Day in 2012, among many other films of his distinctive genre. I have no interest in relitigating the origins of global climate change because at this point I believe it's moot. Methane gas is 84 times as potent a greenhouse gas as CO2, according to the Environmental Defense Fund. See the link in the description. These are the facts. The Arctic is getting warmer. The span of sea ice there is shrinking to the point that the Arctic Ocean is mostly open water in the summer. Blue-green open water absorbs more radiant energy from the sun, which releases more heat into the atmosphere than white reflective ice. Methane gas trapped in Arctic permafrost is then released at an increasing rate because of the action of the warmer wind and precipitation. It's a vicious cycle of heat releasing the substance that causes more heat to be trapped. Just do an internet search for the words vicious cycle methane and global warming and you will see that much has already been said about this phenomenon. The relatively short seven-year half-life of methane is probably a saving grace because it allows the runaway process to be stopped by an extended period of colder conditions. Consider the nightmare scenario if global warming is not interrupted by periods of extreme cold. Eventually the earth would become an oceanless, uninhabitable, high-pressure acidic hotbox like Venus. So a rapid deep freeze is actually good news because the alternative is the boiling death of the planet a bit sooner than it would normally boil to death. Okay, so why will we get a sudden onset ice age instead of a boiling death? According to Art Bell and Whitley Strieber, high rates of melting snow and ice changes the salinity and density of ocean water causing the North Atlantic current to shut down. The North Atlantic current is basically a continuation of the Gulf Stream carrying warm water north of the Arctic Circle. It is sometimes referred to as a barrier current because it blocks super cold air from flowing southeast towards northern Europe. Compounding the shutdown of this barrier is an imbalance between the warm air temperature of the troposphere and the super cold air of the stratosphere. The greenhouse effect not only heats the lower atmosphere but also causes the upper atmosphere to become colder because long wave infrared radiation is absorbed by greenhouse gases before it can reach the upper atmosphere. So, as the surface gets hotter, the sky gets colder until the imbalance reaches a breaking point. Take a look at the State of Climate 2011 Stratospheric Temperature, a web document put out by NOAA, and it's clear that the stratospheric temperatures have fallen over the last 30 years. According to Strieber and Bell, this temperature imbalance constitutes a global store of potential energy that is released suddenly in the form of superstorms with massive amounts of supercooled precipitation. The mechanics of what triggers this supercooled stratospheric air to suddenly dive down seemed intuitive when I first read their book, The Coming Superstorm, those many years ago. Unfortunately, hot air rises and cold air falls is too simplistic to explain the complexities of air circulation between the stratosphere and the troposphere around the globe. Now let's talk about the trigger. First, a blanket of ice covering Arctic waters acts as an insulator preventing heat transfer to the Arctic atmosphere as well as the endothermic process of melting ice absorbing much of the heat that this current might carry. This suggests that the winter ice sheet covering the North Atlantic current in itself might be enough to trigger an ice age. This means that once the current path is covered with ice, the cold air barrier to northern Europe will be overcome even if the current flow resumes. Having said that, I suggested in a video I put up a couple of years ago called Magnetic Field Effects on Ocean Currents See the link below that the Earth's weakening magnetic field might contribute to changing air and sea currents as well as more severe cyclonic storms. 
The Lorentz forces in conducting fluids like seawater and ion-laden storm clouds, I said, acts as a brake that slows down cyclonic rotation. This old magnetohydrodynamics lecture clearly shows that a magnetic field perpendicular to the flow of conducting fluid can suppress vortex production. However, a magnetic field can actually enhance vortex production depending on the angle of incident to the fluid flow. We've now seen rotational J cross B forces creating vorticity and suppressing it. But something else happens in this annular tank where the vorticity originates at a moving wall. Not only that, but the Earth's magnetic field is fairly weak anyway. So we're really talking about a subtle change that might enhance the probability of a sudden climate shift without being a direct cause. The most interesting part of this lecture to me is the rotating magnetic barrel in the trough of mercury that demonstrates how the spin direction of a vortex might actually be reversed with a changing magnetic field. Across the gap, we can apply a radial horizontal magnetic field. Now we put the mercury in. To reveal vorticity, we have this free arm which tethers the float. The paddles of the float are free to rotate with the mercury and so reveal its vorticity. After the mercury reaches a steady state of clockwise motion, we can see that the vorticity is anti-clockwise, as we would expect. But watch what happens when we put on the field. There. Here's the motion again without the field. And it goes on now. The float has the same angular velocity as the frame holding it. So most of the mercury is now rotating like a solid body, slipping over both cylinders. Actually, the slip occurs across thin viscous boundary layers called Hartmann layers. With this mechanical analog, we can see what happens. We spin the loop without the field. When the field comes on, induced forces act briefly until the loop moves like this. There is now no change in magnetic flux linked. There is pure rotation, just as in the mercury. In the flow without the field, the vorticity is such as would cause a loop in the fluid to link a changing flux when the field comes on. So J cross B changes the vorticity to avoid this. As we repeat the experiment, observe the direction of the vorticity. With no field, it's anti-clockwise. The field makes it clockwise. The J cross B forces have also produced intense anti-clockwise vorticity in the thin Hartmann layers. So here, J cross B has rearranged the total vorticity, not suppressed it. We've now seen that magnetic forces can drastically alter a fluid motion, but motion of a conductor can alter a magnetic field, too. The induced currents produce their own magnetic fields, which must upset the original field to some extent. These nails follow a field line. Watch the field change as the loop goes by. This perturbation of the field was a weak effect in all the experiments so far, and we ignored it. But when the induced fields are too big to ignore, an entirely different kind of MHD occurs. To understand this, let's look again at that rotating loop. The induced current creates an induced field, which combines with the original field to make the total field less inclined to the loop than before. The point to notice is that the field is perturbed in such a way that the rise of flux linked by the loop is reduced. Which is a long shot for affecting air movement. However, an ocean current is like a tapestry of interconnecting vortices all strung together in a serpentine path. There is no telling how these currents might change due to a complete flip of the magnetic field. Because of the small magnitude of the forces in the scale, however, a more rigorous analysis is required than we may have the facilities to accommodate. In the process of putting together the materials for this video, I stumbled across what seemed like a more obvious direct cause for a sudden shift in our climate. It has to do with the dramatic loss of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. Higher Arctic temperatures and less ice mean more evaporation and higher humidity. Humid air is less dense than dry air. A dominant fixture of the Arctic region is something called the Arctic High, a permanent high-pressure dome over the North Pole. It exists because of the cold temperatures and low humidity that usually reside there. So what happens when a massive tropospheric temperature inversion manifests itself around late summer or early fall on a particularly hot year when all the sea ice is melted? According to Streber and Bell, woolly mammoths have been found buried in the snow with green vegetation still in their mouths as though they were frozen in place while they were grazing. At that time, the two men could not predict what time of year the disaster would strike. It's clear to me, though, that it will probably be in the late summer or early fall, and sooner rather than later. I hate to make predictions, but my gut says that it'll be within the next four years. Then, the grand universal irony of having a major climate catastrophe landing on the doorstep of an administration full of climate deniers will be fulfilled. Links to the sources and other interesting stuff are in the description.
If you like this content, please rate, comment, and subscribe. My name is R. Crosby Lyles, and this has been News from the Can. Thanks for watching.